started my journey at the Naval Academy in July of 1977. And this slide shows a picture of Bancroft Hall, which is the world's largest uh, dormitory that houses over 4,000 men and women annually as they pursue a college degree. So it was in July of 1977 that I joined my 1,250 classmates. We raised our hands. We took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States, to obey the orders of the president. We were not aware at that time that we were putting our life on the line, that we were willing to say we will fight for our country, we will defend our freedoms. All we knew is that we were being yelled at every day. We had to stick our chin through the back of our head. We had to recite ridiculous things, and it just didn't make sense. But all of this built character. All of this trained us and prepared us for a future that would truly help us not only contribute to our nation's freedoms and protecting those rights that our forefathers have worked so hard to secure for us and what men and women in armed forces today continue to do so, but it also helped embed within several of the young men and women that were there at the school the values of integrity of accountability and responsibility. Now you may ask, what on earth does a former submarine commander, one who was involved in a tragic accident four years ago, you may have forgotten the details of it, but today I'm going to share with you some of the insights that I learned, some of the personal experiences that I encountered when the submarine I commanded, the USS Greenville that you saw in the previous photograph, collided with a Japanese fishing training ship, 1 14th the size of that submarine in physical displacement, in weight displacement. It was only 500 tons heavy. The Greenville was 7,000 tons. Although that vessel was approximately half the length of our submarine, when we collided, the rudder of our submarine cut through the underbelly of the hull of that ship and left a hole 30 feet long, that's 10 yards long, three feet wide, one yard wide, through two watertight bulkheads and it caused it to sink in three minutes. That accident took the lives of nine individuals, killing four teenagers, four 17-year-old students, two of their instructors, and three crew members. Why do I stand before you today and why am I talking to a community that is focusing on issues of, of leadership challenges and management challenges? It's because when you're a leader, responsibility and accountability are absolute. I had one individual in the past week ask me, don't you feel guilty standing in front of an audience? You're now a full-time speaker. You're making an income, earning an income at the expense of nine lives that were lost years ago. Doesn't that make you feel bad? And when I looked at her, I responded and said, ma'am, if you take it from that perspective and from that vantage point, then I could see how that would appear to be shallow. But I'm disappointed because you missed the message. You missed the message perhaps in my delivery. And my message to you today is that in lives we have setbacks and we have disappointments. And for those of you that are watching in remote locations, know that those dis disappointments are nothing more than defining moments in our lives. Those defining moments don't have to define who we are as individuals. What does define us as a person is how we act and how we respond in the aftermath of the crisis. That's why as a leader, when good decisions and bad decisions are made, teams fail or teams succeed, the praise and the accolades are always welcome. But it's a bitter pill sometimes that we have to swallow when we fail. And the true measure of a man or a woman is not so much the outcome as much as how that individual endures the crisis through the challenging times. Keep your character and your integrity intact. So I'm going to talk for about the next 10 to 15 minutes about another individual that had a great influence, and his name is Admiral Hyman G. Rickover. Now you may know Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, if not, he's a man that was an icon in his day when he was alive. Born in Poland, he immigrated to the United States in the early 1920s. He was admitted to the United States Naval Academy. Unprecedented why? Because he was the first Jew to be admitted to that school. First individual of Jewish faith to graduate from the Naval Academy. His parents had great influence. They helped him get a congressional appointment. Graduated at the top of his class. Short in stature, he was a tough guy. You have a couple of tough men in the Dallas-Fort Dallas -Fort Worth area here, and you know exactly who they are, and some of them are dynamos, and one man in particular that I know, another Naval Academy classmate, perhaps, of, or I should say alumni, Ross Perot, has made an incredible fortune and success and touched the lives of hundreds of thousands of people because of his generosity, his leadership, and his mentorship. All of that, too, was learned at that wonderful school, the Naval Academy. Admiral Hyman G. Rickover, however, when he graduated, decided to put his mark on a community that would ultimately have a greater and broader and further reach, and that was the submarine service. Now, what was special there? He knew during World War II as a diesel boat submariner, submarines were limited by their ability to operate because of battery power. They had to remain submerged during the day for stealth to be you know, sneaky, to go do their missions, but at night they would have to surface to recharge their batteries, and that was a physical limitation. So after World War II, he decided to harness the energy of the atomic bomb, put it to good use, and build a Navy nuclear propulsion plant designed to go underwater, give a submarine incredible endurance. So he and a group of men formed Naval Reactors Department of Energy. 
and that particular group today is responsible for all submarine and nuke carrier operations. You see in the photograph to the right, Rickover going down the hatch of the USS Nautilus. It's the first nuke power submarine that circumnavigated the globe. It went under the North Polar Ice Cap, cast, excuse me, North Polar Ice Cap, broke all sorts of endurance records and proved that the only thing that would limit the submarine's capability for remaining underwater indefinitely was the amount of food carried on board the ship. That makes sense. So here's my Rickover story. As a student at the Naval Academy working on a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry, I was offered an invitation to meet with Admiral Rickover. I had a piece of paper on my desk when I returned from class one afternoon in the fall of my senior year, and I looked at the paper and I said, what's the bottom line here? Do I get out of class for a day? And when I found out that I did, I said, I'll go. I'll go do this. This is a good thing. I boarded a bus with 65 of my classmates. We headed to Crystal City in Washington, D.C. We were in a conference room that housed or could hold easily 250 people, but a small group of us, 65, were instructed on what we could say and what we could do to the Admiral as far as our responses. We were told we would have a series of all our interviews we'd go through later that afternoon. The key interview with Admiral Rickover was final and tantamount because it would determine whether or not you could be accepted into the program. 63 of my classmates were gone, disappeared in the course of that afternoon. Another guy and I were sitting there. Waddle began with the letter W towards the end of the alphabet. I got called. My turn was up. The captain said, come with me, young man. We stood outside the outer office. He reminded me that my goal was to pass through the threshold of the outer office door. Inside would be four secretaries sitting at oak desks. Navigate my way past the secretaries. Don't say anything to them. Find the inner office door to the admiral's office. Sit in an oak chair that was in front of his desk. Don't speak until spoken to. And when I was told I was dismissed, to get the heck out of there as quickly as I could. You see, Rickover was a busy man, and he also knew that if he could put you in uncomfortable positions and challenge you, he could truly determine the measure of that individual. When the captain tapped me on the shoulder, I charged through the outer office door. I navigated my way through the secretaries, didn't say hello, saw the inner office door. I saw the admiral. I couldn't see his face because it was being blocked by my resume. I saw the top of his head, the tops of his eyes. I saw the oak chair I was supposed to sit in. I got into the chair. I sat down quickly, and when I relaxed my legs and relaxed my arms, I noticed something bizarre. My rear end started to slide forward in the chair. <laughs> I couldn't figure out. I looked at the chair. I looked at the admiral. looked at the chair. I planted my feet firmly, held onto the armrest, and pushed my rear end back. And as I relaxed my legs and my arms again, it happened all over. My rear end starts to slide out of the seat. <laughs> thinking, what's up with this chair? Well, the questions start coming at me fast and quick. And I'm trying to figure out the problem that I'm faced with. Well, I take my right leg and I bend over and I loop it around the front leg of the chair. I take my left leg and I loop it around the front leg of the chair there. Knowing that I'm firmly locked in place, I'm now comfortable and able to answer the rest of the Admiral's questions. He pauses, he sees, recognizes what I've done. He says, Waddle, you're a cocky son of a gun. Well, here's where the five basic responses you learn as a plebe come into play. Essentially, they're yes, sir, no, sir, I, I, sir, I'll find out, sir, and no excuse, sir. Now, you don't need to write those down at home. <laughs> but they're yes, sir, no, sir, I, I, sir, I'll find out, sir, no excuse, sir. That's what every plebe responds to any upperclassman's question. In this case, I felt like a freshman all over again, and I replied, yes, sir. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't about to pick a fight with this admiral. So the next question I got is, Waddle, I see you went to Fort Benning, Georgia. Yes, sir. You jumped out of perfectly good airplanes this summer of your junior year. Yes, sir. Why on earth would an individual of your intellect and your common sense jump out of an airplane? No excuse, sir, I replied. You're an Eagle Scout. Yes, sir. You're going to have a submarine merit badge when you get to my boats, mister? No, sir. So far, these five basic responses are working for me. They seem to be doing well. And then his face softens, and he gets a smirk on his face, and I knew he had me. He put the resume down. He said, what's this? You're a Naval Academy cheerleader. And if you're laughing at home, that's not too good. He said, well, Mr. Cheerleader, stand up and give me a cheer. Well, I unlocked my legs around the chair, and I stood up, and my mind went blank, and I couldn't think of a single cheer, but suddenly one came to my mind, the U.S. Naval Academy chant, and I start chanting, U-S-N-A. 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 And I get that last A out, and he says, Waddle, shut up and sit down. <laughs> well, when I sit back down, then he starts in to me. He says, your grades have been all over the place, up and down like a roller coaster. Yes, sir, I replied. He said, what are you going to do about it? I thought, ooh, the, the five basic responses don't work here. Sir, I'll study more. Well, how much more? Well, 10 extra hours a week, Admiral. Not enough, he replied. 20 extra hours, I said, Admiral, with so much conviction, thinking he would buy into it. Not enough. And I thought, gosh, seven goes into 20. Not quite three, but that's three extra hours a night. That's really going to put a damper on my social life. <laughs> so I'll study 30 extra hours. And he said, absolutely, you'll study 30 extra hours a week. Now, how do I know you do that? I said, sir, we have the honor code back at school. And he responded with a, come on. <laughs> I was a midshipman once, and I know you have that phrase, you rate what you get away with. No, you'll write me every Monday and tell me what you did the previous week. Yes, sir, I replied. He said, now get the heck out of here. I unlocked my legs again. I started to charge the threshold of the outer door. Before I crossed it, I heard, not so fast, Mr. Cheerleader. 
give me another cheer. <laughs> I paused. I was incensed. I wanted to get back at this guy. And not knowing where my other 63 classmates were, I knew where the one buddy was that was waiting to come after me. I paused and I looked at him and I yelled at the top of my voice, give me an N! <laughs> and in the background you hear this, N! <laughs> It's not the secretaries, it's not the admiral. And I thought, oh my gosh, it's my classmates. They've heard what's going on. They were merely divided from the admiral's office by a small partition. Well, not losing momentum here, I followed it up with, give me an A in her day. Give me a V, V. Give me a Y, Y. What's that spell? Navy were loud and, you know, yelling louder. Navy, one more time. Navy, the walls were resonating. Pictures were bouncing off the admiral's desk. Dust was coming out of the ceiling. He said, Waddle, get the heck out of here. I thought I kind of got back at him. All the while, I was just mortified knowing that my classmates had heard the whole thing but knowing one of their own was in trouble they had come to my aid and responded and when I got back in the conference room with these other guys now in the holding area they said waddle <laughs> you cheerleader we can't we can't wait to tell our buddies back in the hall about this one so that's my Rickover story but what's the point when I came back three years later after serving on my first submarine the USS Alabama I had to pass a very tough and difficult qualification certification process for engineer 12-hour written exams, eight or 10-hour oral interviews, and the final check was to go meet with the Admiral. As I was ushered back into his office and I sat down in the chair, I was looking for that chair. What was it that was so bizarre about that chair? Well, the fact is, is that was really the first test. That oak chair that I had sat in years before had the front legs cut three inches shorter than the back. So there was a natural incline. And the secretaries in between the candidate interviews would come in with a can of pledge and spray the seat of the chair and buff it to a great shine so that the new candidate coming in, sitting in, would slip and kind of fall out. <laughs> Put him in an uncomfortable position. The admiral could see how he would respond to pressure. And I was looking for that same oak chair, but fortunately it wasn't there. As I sat down when he said, Lieutenant, please take a seat, he walked to a filing cabinet, he opened the drawer, pulled out a folder, and on it I saw my name. But it was Midshipman Waddle. Not Lieutenant Waddle, Midshipman Waddle. He flipped to the contents and I thought, my goodness, those are the letters I wrote. And he paused and he said, okay, okay, what's this? 28 hours. And I thought I was in trouble. I hadn't studied 30 and I couldn't remember what happened. The details were so long buried in the past and went to the next letter, 34 hours. All right, I see you made up for the difference. Lieutenant, what did you learn from this, he asked. I said, Admiral, never in my wildest dreams did I ever envision you would retain these letters and keep that information. But I would be so embarrassed today sitting here in your office knowing that I hadn't kept my promise much less the fact that you retain these things, it'd be a professional embarrassment to me. He said, why is that? I said, because of the tenets of integrity, accountability, and responsibility, those three words that I shared with you early on, those values that foster trust and confidence within an organization that help break down barriers and allow groups to succeed and do well. I said, sir, you founded this program on the tenet of integrity. Uncompromising integrity breeds trust. You can, you can put your life in the hand of another individual and know you'll be okay because he will do the right thing. I didn't say he and she because in the submarine force it's still one of the last bastions where only men serve, just like in special forces, but I believe in a vision someday that will change. But at the time, that's the way it was. He said, anything else, Lieutenant? I said, yes, sir. I had the highest grade point average that last semester my senior year at the Naval Academy. You taught me if I worked harder and did more than just the bare minimum, I could, I could truly achieve great success. And he said, Lieutenant, you got it. You got the lesson. He said, unfortunately, another classmate today who didn't keep his word and didn't promise or made a promise but didn't fulfill it has been summarily dismissed from our program. You see, I can't trust him because his word is no good. And that meant a lot to me. That sent a message that riveted throughout not only the submarine force but the surface navy and other echelons where rickover stories of this magnitude are often shared. Even to this day, despite the man's death, those that have passed on and now currently serve in his present position the one that he formerly occupied, continue to uphold those traditions of integrity, accountability, and responsibility.